hello there. Um, let's see, there were five attendees. I want to see who you are. We are using Sandy. Hi, Sandy, Lisa, L, Gretchen, and Sherry. I wonder if these are Sherry Nakamoto and Sandy Steinfeld. So, hello, everyone. We are using a different format this time. We're trying out this new webinar software, um, Demio. And I hope I don't make any mistakes and forget. I'm just hoping that this is recorded. Yep, I think this is just automatically recorded. And I believe, so this is a good part to just get familiar <laughs> with all the chat buttons. We did a test run yesterday and turned out fine if it's just me and Dave, but I don't know. I'm gonna just say hi, everyone in the chat box and let us know where you're growing from, what herbs you have on your list, because I do hope you have your list of herbs because that's gonna be very helpful tonight. Um, piece of paper, black paper, 10 minutes, we're 10 minutes, eight minutes or now early. So this is a great time that if anybody wants to say something public, the chat is currently set to public for this event. All messages in the general chat will be seen. Yep, so if you guys wanna type in the chat box, so it's the format here in this webinar is that we cannot just talk to you like the Zoom calls, but only favorite messages are shown. Okay. So use the chat function if anybody, let's see who else popped in. So we have Sandy, Lisa, Sarah, L, Gretchen, Sherry, and Andrea. I wonder if this is Andrea writes. Um, so yeah, we are using Demio and the chat is on the upper right for me. I'm not sure how it looks like for you all. I'm here as a moderator as well. Dave, yay, thank you. If you have any questions while Nikki presents. <clears throat> so I guess the difference is that we can't hear Dave's voice now, unless you turn on your mic, Dave, or unless you probably were, if we made you a presenter, then you might be able to do that. And I'm going to go ahead, so it's six, six, <clears throat> seven minutes in. If you guys have any preliminary questions or you wanna share your list of herbs or let us know where you are going from, I'm gonna go ahead and show our like, our beans that have come in. This is definitely not the only haul, <laughs> haul that we've had today, but we've had a host of other things like um, grapes. We have lots of grapes. We've had squashes and zucchini and cucumbers and some tomatoes. Um, we harvested Turkish rocket, which is an, a bitter herb. And, I, um, and in terms of herbs, what we are growing are sage, yarrow, calendula, thyme, mints. I've packaged up some mints for, um, for sale. For, we, we have a sale coming up. So without further ado, I'm gonna share my, my screen because this is a long webinar. I hope I share the right one. Presentation materials, share. A screen. So if you don't have it yet, um, please have your paper and pen handy so that you can write down your herbs and or bring your herbs with you. So let me see if I have any other things open. Yes, Canva. Sure. All right, I'm gonna go all the way to the top and present. There, build your own herb garden. All right, can you all see that? I don't mean to start really early, <laughs> but I did wanna be ready because I'm afraid that I'm gonna make a mistake and then I'll be fumbling with all this at, on the dot at eight o'clock. So if you guys have anything to say in the chat, uh, Dave is right there with me. This is more of a, a workshop workshop. I don't know if I like the feel of this versus Zoom and you let us know in, in the chat box if you'd rather have like a more open mic kind of event 
instead of a presentation event. But I just wanted to make a disclaimer from the start, since this is recorded and people who are watching the webinar will probably not want me to drone on about anything else but the, the herb webinar. Um, so I am not an herbalist. Most of my advice will be on the growing side of herbs instead of the using of herbs. That being said, I do have some knowledge and attended a few herbal courses taught by some of the most revered herbalists. So I do know that you shouldn't treat herbs as one-off cures, like you know the way we have those OTC medicines or the counter drugs where, okay, I wanna lower my fever, I'm gonna get Tylenol. So when you, you I for fever reduction here, it's called antipyretics or anti, yeah, um, diaphoretics. Sometimes they, they use that term in herbalism is basically when they, they have your blood circulate more, the, the herb makes you heat up more or sweat more, and that sort of releases, brings down the fever. So there are lots of herbs that do that, and we're gonna talk about some of the culinary herbs that do that tonight. And let's say um, you, don't, you don't experience the same thing that you would experience when you just take Tylenol and your fever goes down dramatically instantly right away. So when I take yarrow or when my kids take yarrow, it does take a few hours before it kicks in and I take, we give it to them over, you know, over and over again throughout the course of the day, yarrow tea. And that helps a lot reduce the fever in a natural way. So it doesn't work like right away. It works over the course of the day. And then there's some herbs that are, I don't know what they're called again, but they're the herbs that are building. So herbs that like reishi, which is a mushroom and considered an herb, builds your immunity the more and more you take it. So um, the, don't expect that the, when I say this is good for <laughs> fever or this is good for arthritis or so and so, it's not like you have arthritis, you take this and you won't have arthritis. You know, it's something that's like a maintenance dose almost or until that ailment goes away. And herbs do work, but they are tailor made also, not just in that respect. Are they different than medicines that are chemically made? But they are tailor made. They're tailor made to a person of a certain constitution. So I mentioned this in the blog that in the case of ginger, um, I know somebody, some people, especially the Chinese, they wake up especially in the winter time in the fall and they're cold. Um, they take a little bit of ginger tea, and that helps them sweat and heat up a bit. And because they're that kind of cold person where if you're the kind of person and you, you need all the covers at night, your hands often get cold and clammy and your feet and your extremities do, then ginger is a, an herb that's suited better to you. But if you're a person who, who sweats a lot and who, um, I mean, who doesn't feel the heat, who's usually the warm person that people depend on to hug so that they get warmer, then peppermint might be a better or more suitable herb tea. So it's not a one size fits all remedy either. Okay, so for, all right. Um, and we are one minute into, I'm gonna check your guys' chats really quick and see, should I be seeing a video yet? Oh, yes, you should. Share my screen. Trying to figure out if my, you should see a slide. So yes, you should see my slide. Mm -hmm. So Sandy, hello, Christela. Hello, Sarah, the video is working. I can see the slides. Hey, Nicole, I wonder if this is Nicole Finson. And Sandy, Sherry, yes, Sherry Nakamoto. Sherry, hello, we are growing echinacea, lemon balm, basil, 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 apple, mint, lavender. Oh my goodness, that is so much. Yep, hi. <laughs> okay, switching computers. You pronounced my name right. Christina, wonderful. Okay, I am so excited to see the chat popping a bit. So yes, come with your herbs and I'm gonna switch right back and, and go back into the presentation. All right, so first slide. So once again, Dave is the moderator. Um, he is going to manage the chat box I just wanted to show you what to expect tonight. We're gonna to do a little intro on herbs, especially culinary herbs and their medicinal properties. Uh, list your herbs, please. We're gonna list our herbs that we have selected, preliminary and initial herbs, and then try to thoughtfully design them in a permaculture way into our gardens. And finally draw or like plot on screen um, how a tip, 
an example, a sample herb garden would be. So I have a sample ready-made one um, for you guys to see and work on. And you guys do your own thing with your own list of herbs as we go. And you may, you know, don't be afraid. This initial list may grow as you learn more about the herbs here tonight. So why herb gardens? Why are we doing an educational webinar on herb gardens tonight? Well, part of our mission is to educate and inspire and nurture a global community of families who provide themselves with food, medicine, and spiritual connection through ecological gardening. So that's where the herbs come in, is that we want our food to be our medicine, and we want to promote those plants that we know have worked um, traditionally for many, many years to um, as, and has, have aided as remedies to our our bodies. So we also have a vision of teaching and discovering how growing holistically leads to freedom and abundance. So this is why we do what we do. The best thing about herbs is that, you know, why herbs and why not the things that people grow um, uh, can easily buy store-bought, you know, that are chemically made. So nature itself, this is the doc, the father of medicine, Hippocrates says, nature itself is the best physician. And we want to extend our understanding of medicine into this, the herbs that we eat day to day. So we wanna optimize our use of culinary herbs. Think of, Think of herbs as tasty ways to add nourishment and healing properties to our food. We want to break out of that mold that only certain things are breakfast foods or certain things can be eaten as food. Instead, think of herbs as tasty ways to add nourishment and healing to your body. Take even culinary herbs in doses far greater than what we are accustomed to doing for a greater benefit. So normally, we even in Italian cooking, for instance, they a recipe will tip, typically call, a recipe that you've downloaded online, right, will typically call for like a teaspoon of oregano or a teaspoon of basil. Why not double that? Why not up that to like two tablespoons sometimes? I have a borscht recipe, which is a, an ethnic or Russian or Eastern European recipe of um, always has beets in it, which is a great detox uh, plant, but it has a table, two tablespoons of pepper in the whole soup. And by golly, when you drink it, it is not as peppery as one would expect, but the pepper was put there so that you could, pepper is known to um, make the nutrients in the soup, in the beets, more bioavailable to you. So it helps your body absorb that nutrient, that detoxifying nutrient inside beets and carrots and what your onions and garlic that go into that soup better. So that's a, that's a medicinal use of pepper. Now I want to start with thyme, which is great for all kinds of infections, including yeast, ringworm, fungal infections. I am not, a, like I said, I'm not a certified herbalist. So I'm not going to discuss how they're, they're prepared and used. I, I have a recipe on urban farm podcast where I put thyme and lavender in a spray bottle. We've cooked thyme down, sit it overnight on the pot, pour it into a spray bottle, and you can use that as your antibacterial sort of spray, maybe with some vinegar um, around the house. And this is because thyme is such a great flavorful and antimicrobial herb. It relieves muscle spasms, is great to use whenever there's an infection, and some uses also include teas, mouthwash, and like I said, antibacterial all-purpose sprays. Thyme prefers to grow in rocky, poor, dry soils in places with a Mediterranean climate, and this means warm, dry summers and wet winters, and if you guys have are on my newsletter, then you would have read a little bit about what that Mediterranean climate is in the States, and it's found in in California. So that is where thyme would normally be super easy to grow and grow like a weed. And in, and you can see here in permaculture, we like to talk about analogs, climate analogs. And what does that mean? It means that if you live in California um, and you want to know what grows well in your backyard, then all you would have to do is look around the world and see what grows in the same climate analog as yours around the world. So what would grow in the Mediterranean basin here or what would grow in central Chile and 
the Cape of South Africa or Western Australia, and most likely that can grow in your backyard as well because it would prefer that climate. But we can mimic that climate. If you don't live in California and you want to grow thyme, it doesn't mean that you can't. You can, but you can mimic it. Uh, and in a small amount of space, such as an herb spiral, you can put it at the very top as it is right here, where it would get the most drained out dry soil, which is what they love. And you know that anything that's like a succulent is something that's in the desert or in a dry land, right? It's, it holds those oils in, in it. And you would put it on the Western side because we live in the Northern hemisphere and the hottest part of the day is towards the afternoon. So it gets anything that's Southwest facing will get baked in the afternoon and that's where it wants to be. So you would put this time in the Southwest portion to get the ma uh, maximum amount of heat and sun that it likes in order to thrive. Now, peppermint is the next culinary herb that I wanted to explore. Don't let peppermint fool you. It is a great cooling plant, which also helps in digestive ailments. There are several herbs in this mint family, really, and mints are fairly easy to grow, and they're both culinary and medicinal. So it's a great cooling plant, which also helps in tummy aches, diarrhea, it freshens your breath, is a cure for hiccups. I haven't tried this one, but I just read it. And I thought, and among my course notes, and I thought, wow, I better try it. So if anybody has hiccups, have them drink peppermint tea. Externally, it is known to relieve itching and pain. Peppermint happens to be a hybrid, ooh, wrong spelling, cross between a water mint and a spearmint. As with most mints, it prefers damp or often irrigated soils, and it actually prefers the shade. Although they produce seeds, they propagate best through their runners. So in an herb spiral, same thing. We talked about herb spiral. Um, they are all, so they would be where? Can anyone tell me if you guys are on the chat box? If you had an herb spiral and this was, what, what part of your herb spiral do you think the peppermint would be in? I'm gonna go and see, bottom, yes. Very good, yes, they like it wet north awesome you guys are so smart you guys should be giving this webinar okay yes so that's where they would be so that's where you'd put the peppermint sage another member of the mint family which is easy to grow and has different medicinal and culinary uses is sage i often find sage um, complementing dishes where the main star is a sweet potato, squash or pork, sometimes chicken, but it's an amazing medicinal herb. It was used by the Native American Indians in the plains, especially in their sac sacred rituals. And also, have you heard of the Four Thieves vinegar recipe? Has anybody heard of that? If you guys are familiar with that, <laughs> I'm looking for that. Well, um, the Four Thieves, apparently during the bubonic plague, there were these four thieves and we're not quite sure whether the story goes, um, they escaped the bubonic plague using this vinegar, which they had a recipe of. And some stories say the thieves were robbing the dead or the sick. And another version says that the thieves had already been caught before the outbreak and their sentence had been to bury dead plague victims. So to survive the punishment, they created this vinegar. So whatever the case may be, the vinegar um, actually contained sage in it, among other things, I think cloves. <laughs> so. The, that's really interesting. So if you can, uh, another thing about sage is that 94% of bacteria in the air, if you burn sage, it will kill 94% of that pathogenic bacteria. And it's not like for the moment that you burn it, it's for 30 days. So this is an NIH study. You can look it up at lcb.com, I think, um, where they found this out. And so that's whenever you have sickness in the house, we burn the sage and put it against the air vents so it circulates around. In recent years, it has also been shown to combat Alzheimer's, diabetes, and balanced cholesterol. Sage is known to grow in the grassland plains and loves the full sun. It can grow woody stems and is perennial in zones four to nine. Garlic, one of the easiest, most bang for your buck herbs that you can grow, well known for st stimulating circulation. Another thing that you can take when you have fevers because it'll bring that fever down. Being an antimicrobial, vermifuge, which means if you happen to have parasites, good thing to take, diaphoretic and expectorant. So easy to plant, 
A lot of you have done this already in our plant your pantry challenge. You get one of these cloves mid autumn um, in a sunny location with rich, well drained soil. Set those cloves root side down four to six inches apart and cover with one to two inches of fine soil. In the north, you can put down more mulch for the winter protection so it can overwinter if you have a really cold winter. Um, and for us, you know, we don't even have to mulch. I know for zone 7B in Northern Virginia, somebody planted it, one of our friends planted it in January and it still came up same time with the rest of the garlics in the spring. So garlic may begin growth late in the fall or early in the spring. And what's nice is they get, even gives you, depending on the variety that you plant, these garlic scapes, which are also culinary um, gourmet items. So he, see here, this is from Mom's Organic, our local organic grocery store. It's $5.99 a pound of these organic scapes, which you just get for free from one clove of garlic. And they are also edible. So allium family. So that's the lily family of both Scallions are also gar are also alliums, and they are easy. These particular ones are easy to cut and come again. So the herbs that I'm featuring here are both culinary and easy to grow. So you can regrow them perpetually from store bought roots. Like like garlic, they are often antimicrobial. But garlic, the clove, how is that an herb? It's it's it has an affinity to cure more of the ear ailments. So if any of our kids have like ear infections, they say you know, put garlic in an in oil and then drip that oil down your down your, your uh, little baby's ear and that will help cure that ear ache in the morning, like at night before he goes to sleep and in the morning they say he wakes up and he has, his ear infection is gone. So I have not had the need, thank God, to um, to do this. But even teachers at our school <laughs> harvest the garlic in our schoolyard and they said, oh, whenever I have an infection, I just put, I just keep, it's the actual clove of the garlic in his ear and just um, without the oils. And he said it helps him. So rich in vitamin B2, K8, this is back to the scallions. So scallions and onions are particularly good for lung infections, not ear aches. So ear aches, that's garlic. Lung stuff, you can make a poultice out of these onions. When you, um, when you cook them down a bit in oil, you put that oil in a rag, put that rag on top of the chest of your son. I have this like in my highlights in my Instagram account if you wanna see how it's done and, and that um, congestion goes away after a few hours. So um, totally useful herb. So cut these green tops, regrow root base in water until a fair amount of roots like these start to develop, transfer outdoors or into a pot in a sunny location. Even indoors, you can grow this year round. Um, outdoor scallions may be grown late in the fall or early in the spring. Indoors, they can produce year round. Ginger, so in Ayurveda, Ayurveda, which is like the oldest traditional medicine that there is. Ginger is called the universal medicine because it cures a host of things. And that's why I have just presented to you what in Indian cuisine is called the Trinity roots, ginger, garlic, and scallions. Whenever you have Indian dishes and they have, you know, ha they have those things, they're usually not just for um, culinary purposes, but they're for medicinal purposes. And they have them in spades, like they use a lot of the garlic, use a lot of the onion, and use a lot of the ginger to make your dish more potent, more powerful. So it is well studied as a help for nausea and digestive ailments. Traditionally, it's used for colds, flu, muscle spasms, and migraines. I use this for my fire cider, in my fire cider um, and stick, and I use this for whenever we have, I use this in, in a preparation for menstrual cramps, tea, yarrow, and ginger, and that works really well with me and my daughter whenever we have menstrual cramps. So all you have to do to grow it is stick a thumb size like this portion here, portion of a ginger root into a pot of soil, and it actually thrives on neglect. So make allowances for the root development when you do that. Give it a big radius of a pot, water every three days unless it rains, and wait for three months before harvesting. Usually prefers the shade ginger does. And here it is in my backyard 
where you can see how small my pot was. And actually this year, I didn't even use this pot. I used this long pots and it's still growing. This grow that didn't grow as well. Like, I don't know, the leaves look healthier in this one, but I have rows and rows of ginger on this pot this year, which I'm, I can smell, but I don't know if I want to harvest them yet. So now we go to the actual design portion of the herb garden. So I'm going to see, I'm going to give away a packet of seeds to people who can answer one of the questions I will have. We hope you have your initial, is this helpful so far? Do you have to harvest the whole root? Did you mean that for the ginger, Sandy? Yeah, it looks like a bit like an iris tuber. Mm -hmm. That's right. Fresh ginger is more potent than you find in the supermarket as well. Yes. Oh, I'm glad you find this helpful. Okay, so now we're going to, we hope you bring out your lists and we're going to write down the list of herbs. If you don't have it, write it down right now. Use the herb garden table, sketch out your plan. And here it is. So this is your herb garden table without these two columns quite yet. So you want to put the plant name, medicinal use, and where it grows. And we're going to talk about, this is the permaculture part of it, the seven layers of a food forest. And one way of designing your backyard is with layers in mind, because I promised you we would plant your herbs using every inch of your backyard garden, and you can definitely do that. Layers are that are similar to those of a food forest. So the picture shows just what is a food forest in the first place, right? Let's begin by thinking about just a forest in general. No gardener tends a forest. No one waters the forest floor intentionally. It has checks and balances already in place, and it's pretty stable, stable place to live in. Well, we want that for your backyard as well. We want to have a forest that yields food, and in this case, herbs, but without much work on your part. How do we get there? One of the ways is by designing this way with the layers in mind. And layers are, like this picture shows, there are seven layers, there may be more. And in our case, to keep it simple, we are going to do just five. But let's read off, um, let me see, the next list. Let's see, the layers are, let's read off these the list. We have the overstory layer, which is also called the canopy layer. We have the understory layer, which are trees that prefer the shade, don't mind not having as much sun. You have the shrub layer, this one looks like an elderberry. And then we have an herbaceous layer where most of our herbs may be. And then we have a root layer and we also have a vine layer. So do not worry if your initial list does not have all the layers, okay? That's part of what we're learning here in this course is just let's see how many, how many, we've, <laughs> how many herbs we can get in each of these layers, right? So here we are again, we're gonna discuss now our layers, tree, vine, shrub, herb, root, and hawthorn. So in my list, which is taken from the plants on my recent medicinal herbs blog, I have hawthorn as my medicinal tree. Yes, hawthorn berry is a very good help for heart and cardiovascular disease, as well as many other things. So hawthorn is my star player, if you will. It's my tree in the center of everything. Um, and then I have passion fruit as my herb, which is also a vine, happens to be a vine. And it's a medicinal vine. There are few medicinal vines out there. The one I have here, passion flower, the others are hops, honeysuckle. But passion flower is a great tea ingredient. If you read any of the sleepy tea ingredient lists, they usually will have passion flower, um, lavender, hops, right? Ca California poppy not just chamomile. So if you're, if people say like, I can't, you know, the sleepy teas don't work for me, the chamomile doesn't work for me, then here's an alternative that might work for them. Passion flowers, it's used as a sedative, it's a great sedative and antidepressant even. Now in the shrub layer, we have elder. Elderberry is my shrub or bush layer. It's still a woody stem, tall plant, but not quite a tree. And it's famous for being a great cough syrup. And for the cold and flu months, I always have this in my cabinet. So excited that this is the first year that we actually have berries from this. And even the flower, the elder flower, peppermint and yarrow are the components of, it's not throat coat, but it's that other one that we always flew, that we always have. That's also a traditional medicinals um, box of teas. So we do yarrow, elder, bear, elder flower, and peppermint whenever somebody gets 
a fever or a flu or the first signs of flu um, this coming, you know, this coming fall season, especially now that school is about to start. And then I have also in, in the herb layer rather, American licorice. This one I did not talk about in the blog, but it is great for throat ailments. It's sweet and we will, I have more about its medicinal actions a little bit later, but it is a native, this particular one is native to the States. So I like it because not only is it an herb that is sweet that I use in my throat coat or any teas whenever I have a sore throat, you know, ginger and licorice, always a good, nice to have, but it also happens to be a nitrogen fixer. So I have three things. I've stacked three functions here, medicinal use, well, two, maybe more than three, but like it's also, it also happens to be a pollinator plant. It's a nitrogen fixer. And here, what are nitrogen fixers to review? So most of the nitrogen that we have N2 in our air present, it's 78%, our air, atmospheric air is made of 78% nitrogen. And this is in N2 form, but when this nitrogen enters, it cannot enter the plant without the help of without it turning into either ammonia, NH4, or nitrates, NO3. Some plants like ammonia, such as blueberries, the more acidic ones, and most plants like nitrate, NO3. And what are the bacteria that transform these N2 nitrogens into the form that the plant can uptake? They are called rhizobium or francia bacteria, and they're located in the roots of legume plants and legume trees, and actually, nitrogen fixing trees such as um, nitrogen fixing plants such as what I just mentioned, licorice. So interesting, interesting to note that. Now I wanted to talk also about a root layer herb, daikon. Daikon is also medicinally used for something, but I, it escapes me. I, I told myself I would research it right before here, but it's not listed on my list of herbs. But I wanted to talk about daikon in particular as being a a plant that had a long taproot. And this is a plant that we, in permaculture, we call dynamic accumulators. Dynamic accumulators are plants that mine the soil in those layers that other plants cannot normally get to, bring up the nutrients from there. And they don't bring up all the nutrients. Sometimes they're nutrient specific. So some, some um, plants will say, will only bring up a lot of manganese or some will bring up a lot of copper into their body, their root and into their, the plant stem and the actual leaves. And when those leaves die, when the plant leaves fall into the ground, then they remineralize the soil above so that it has, it sort of spreads all that, uh, the minerals that are in the bottom, brings it up top for other plants to use. And why do I talk about dynamic accumulators? Because dandelion is one of those herbs that's not just an herbal medicine, which is great for, uh -huh. now I can't, anything that's digestive, <laughs> great for diabetics. You guys probably help me out. You probably know, know better than me what this, what um, dandelion's for. I have a list later, later on, in the, but I'm not reading off of it. So now I've forgotten. Um, it's great blood building herb detoxifier, and for liver ailments, that's what it's used for. So dandelion is also a great dynamic accumulator. And it's one of those ones that actually brings up a lot of the minerals, you know, na you name it, like copper, manganese, boron, in the underground root system that they have, they bring it up to the top of their leaves. So this is a great herb to have and to cultivate organically where the lawns are not sprayed and to have in your teas to boost your immunity and to just um, aid in your digestion in a daily basis. You can leave, use the leaves in salads. You can use all parts of the flower. All parts of this plant are edible. Even the roots, you know, they, they roast the roots, put that in a tea as well. And so we've talked about, what we've talked about is not just the layers here, the tree, the vine, the shrub, the herb, the root, layers of a food forest. We've also talked about guild function. And what do I mean by guild function? Now stay with me because there are only a few functions to be discussed and we've already discussed some of them, but uh, this is basically looking at your food forest as a whole um, concert, like orchestra. 
that in concert, they are all feeding one another and they all give a little nuanced function to make the system more efficient and more effective together. So we had the nitrogen fixation, we had dynamic accumulation. Some of our plants will simply be wildlife food and shelter providers like echinacea. Right? The, some birds will only feed on echinacea because they, are, they happen to be vegetarian or whatnot. And they, they just like the, the, the echinacea flower seeds. And some of the functions will act will be ground cover where they act as the living mulch on the floor so that they can retain soil or retain, retain moisture in the soil and um, keep from the soil, keep the soil from eroding. Now there are other functions like some plants will be great for coppicing, meaning they use the wood to feed their stoves or they use to wo the wood to make baskets. Some will be aromatics that confuse the pests. So we'll talk about these in a little bit, but I wanted to show you what my list look like. Some of you had great, um, I'm going to check back on you guys and see. Dandelions and muffins taste like honey. We like this tea from Yogi called Relaxed Mind. Yes. Yes. So passion flower grows fast and it happens to be a perennial where, you know, where we live, it's a perennial. Um, and sometimes it's grown indoors too. I'll, I'll let it cover the fence. Yep. There we go, Sherry, you know much about herbs. They help break down the fats, daikon. Yes, I, the herbal, so the, the creator of uh, Yogi Tea, KP Khalsa, he, uh, he's the chief formulator of the Yogi Tea um, teas. And he talks about himself having, having the need to take daikon soup in medicinal amounts and, and um, detoxifying in that way. Great. Yes, they, they, I would say dynamic accumulators fulfill their functions whenever they're chopped and dropped. Yeah. So that's the thing. Like you have to like have their leaves sort of disintegrate into the mulch um, for that to, for them to fulfill the functions. Yeah. Okay. So licorice is definitely a legume or just a nitrogen. It's both. It's both a legume and a nitrogen fixer, Sandy. Good questions. You can see when you grow it, it has those um, characteristic nitrogen fixing, uh, stop sharing. It has those characteristic nitrogen fixing pinnate leaves, like one stem with lots of leaves that way, and then seed pods. So that, that's how you know that you have a legume. Looks like a pea, you know, looks like a bean. Sometimes a tree will look like that kind, that too. Okay, my goodness. Dave, can you prepare a question for me for the raffle? <laughs> Carob tree smells bad. Do you know anything about it? You know, I have not. I do not know anything about that, but that's something good that I could research. I am happy to research that one. All right, so I'm going to keep on, keep on keeping on here. Go back to this. Dave, you just tell me if I am not being heard or my slides are not, you know, you're not being shared or anything of that sort. So food forest layers, this is my list. So we have the tree, we have the vines, so my tree is hawthorn. It also has this additional guild function of being a nectary, provides nectar or pollen for beneficial insects and provides food for beneficial birds and other invertebrates. It's medicinal action, like I mentioned, is heart and cardiovascular tonic joint and digestive tonic. By tonic, they just mean, now they have a new word for it, adaptogen, basically like overall building, uh, builds up your resistance to that, to deal with those ailments, right? Hypotensive is the opposite of hypertensive, expels phlegm. I know I wrote this down before. Author. And hypotensive is, the, hypertensive is when, um, yeah. So it supports connective tissue and it grows in 69, zone 69. So our vine is passion flower. It's a wildlife food. Sometimes the hummingbirds will just attack the passion flower. It's anti-anxiety, antidepressant, and it's a sedative, grows in zone six to 10. It's, and then we have elderberry as a shrub. Again, a wildlife food and shelter, a nectary to specific insects. And elderberry is antimicrobial, antiviral, diuretic, anti-inflammatory. 
Oh my goodness, did I not share? Sorry, I did not press the button. Now do you see me? Dave and I are in different rooms. So, so that I can't hear him now, especially that we're not on Zoom. Okay. Um, licorice is a nitrogen fixer and a dynamic accumulator, provides wildlife shelter, is antiviral, anti-inflammatory, an immuno immunomodulator, which also means that it anytime it's in that season of flu, you take it like you know, every now and then, and you will be good against. Every time you feel like, oh, I got a scratchy throat. Demulcent always means something sweet or moistening, especially for the throat. Now we have tree, vine, shrub, herb, nitrogen fixer, dynamic accumulator, but we missed ground cover. Where is my ground cover? So my ground cover in this exercise is creeping time. I think you can also say dandelion is a good ground, dry, uh, ground cover, don't you think? Oh, there it is. So dandelion is a diuretic, which means if you need to weed or go, then you 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 take this herb, antibi antibacterial liver tonic, blood balancer, because it lowers sugar. I know that. Kidney tonic, digestive still stimulant, and mild laxative. And then ground cover in this case for me would be my creeping thyme. And it's not just a great ground cover, it's also an aromatic, which because of its scent will confuse um, the pests that are attacking certain things in your garden. Now, other uses I, I put here, studies show that used as a preservative, creeping time can increase the shelf life of fish by 15 to 20 days. This is an Icelandic study where creeping time loves to grow. And uh, the, the herbalist talking about creeping time in Iceland also mentioned that she used it in her acne treatment with calendula, so, and it was a hit with teenagers. I wish I knew what that acne treatment <laughs> formula was for my daughter. Uh, it's antibacterial, antispasmodic, but you need to take it until your breath smells like thyme oil, expectorant, anti-acne. And the other thing about thyme is that recently, you know how more and more most of our medicines are becoming more um, resistant to the antibiotics? Well, for those patients, they did a study where time was introduced in, an, in a case that that was, where the person receiving the antibiotic was not fighting off his infection and time actually helped to fight the infection or help make them more um, susceptible to be, to be killed by the antibiotics. So that's an interesting study too. Garlic is a nectary. Um, and it's an aromatic for sure. <laughs> it's a great pest deterrent spray, right? Stimulates circulation. It's antimicrobial, used against parasitic worms. It's a fever reducer, an expectorant. And finally, um, a ginger is a ground cover. I have I wrote this down because I read it somewhere in some tropical place for shady areas, very low maintenance, anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial, and expectorant. Aid for nausea. So revisit your herb garden layer plant yield function medicinal use USDA zone right now. Take a look at what you've listed and now we're gonna draw it. Build redundancies into your system. So in my case, I have herbs. So we didn't have an herbaceous layer and the herbs in my layer, just like some of you are echinacea, Tulsi and lemon balm, and I don't just have one. So don't be afraid if you have like everything at the beginning of your list was herbs. You can keep all those herbs in your plan, just add on some nitrogen fixers, just add on some trees if you can, if your backyard allows for it, just add on some vines so that you can utilize every space of your garden, right? Um, it's good to build redundancies because if let's say my lemon balm failed, then at least I have two other herbs that I could depend on but all of these are easy to grow. Tulsi is easy to grow, lemon balm is easy to grow, and echinacea is easy to grow. So definitely, depending on your USDA zone, right? <laughs> That's the other caveat. I guess Tulsi is hardy in the hot, hot climates, but it's annual everywhere else. So how does that, here are some of their medicinal actions. We know echinacea is always taken, you know, first sign of, of um, flu, but you can't take it after a few days because then your body gets used to it because it mimics the um, immunomodulating 
proteins that are on the surface of your, your cells, it mimics like an infection as if your body were receiving an infection, but it's actually echin echinacea so that your body starts producing all its white, you know, blood cells and, and um, producing this response that is fighting off the infection. Um, but it can't do that for a sustained period of time. So you can't take the echinacea after like three days or two days. So our first few days, first two days is when we take it. Um, Tulsi, or in the Indian say Tulasi, holy basil, is so relaxing and relaxing nervine. I always try to take it every day. I've given this as Christmas gifts. It's so many neuroprotective, you know, <laughs> if you feel like you're getting brain fog, things in the relaxed mind tea that they've mentioned in the chat box, all of those shampoo shpi, um, I don't think it had Tulsi in it, but it had uh, there are other herbs, chrysanthemum, um, I can't remember all the herbs in that relaxed mind formula, but all of those herbs go to cola. That's the one. So they are neuroprotective. Obviously, I, I haven't been taking them. Or maybe I have, so I haven't been blanking out as much as I would have normally been. <laughs> so I can remember some of the names. But whenever you're like brain, I have brain fog. I didn't sleep enough. Those are the, that's why we, I take relaxed mind because I feel like those herbs are great for the brain great for you to remember things. Go to cola in particular is taken by med students for, you know, who have very little sleep and who have to memorize a lot. So um, Tulsi is another similar, similar. And Tulsi is not just, it's also known as an adaptogen, which is a new herbal word for, it just helps overall, your overall well-being makes, increases your life span and um, rejuvenates your, feeds your adrenals so that you're not just going flight, flight, fight, fight all the time, fight or flight all the time um, and stressed out. It definitely relaxes you and makes you and feeds you and makes you sleep when you need to sleep. So lemon balm, dynamic accumulator, ground cover, wildlife shelter, all these wonderful guild functions, you know, and it's an herbaceous and my herbaceous uh, level. So if somehow during the year, I only have Tulsi in the summer. I run out of Tulsi in the winter. I still have lemon balm that I can depend on in my garden as my relaxing nervine. It also is a fever reducer or it will make you sweat. So that's another one that people have said have they have taken for longevity. So we've covered everything, lay, layers, and now we're going into sketching your garden. P38. Okay, so very quickly, let's divide your paper into half. Let's draw our perennials in first, like half, because one part will be summer and one part will be winter. Draw in your perennials, and then we will fill it in with annuals. Don't be afraid if you make mistakes, we'll fix the positions later. So here, start with a tree in the middle, the shrubs that surround it, and then this ring around it is because I've estimated how big my tree is gonna be. So even if you don't know that now, you can research it later, but then if you can just Google diameter, maximum diameter growth of my hawthorn tree or whatever tree you have, your apple tree, if you're not using an herb as your main tree tonight, you know, for your overall garden, garden um, project, then you would have to find the maximum width, width or circum uh, diameter of your tree that your tree will grow into because then you don't wanna shade out the shrubs underneath it that might long for the sun which I think in the case of elderberry, they do like a bit of sun to grow more vibrantly. And then I grow, I put them, the annuals both, I mean the perennials both in the winter and the summer, because I will see them both then. But then when I add in the other perennials, I will add in just their names if they're dormant in the winter. So for instance, I've added elder as my shrub, elderberry as my shrub, thyme as my perennial ground cover, lemon balm is my perennial herb. And I have them drawn here, you know, their picture is here, but they're, but echinacea and garlic will kind of be dormant during the winter. So I don't have them drawn out. Passion flower will be dormant in the winter. So I have don't just have its name. And in the summer, I'll see a passion flower, you know, grow up the tree. I'll see my echinacea and then I can see, okay, at this point in time, from the top view alone, you can also do the side view, but from the top view alone, I will be filling in my garden more. So I definitely have to have place, space for the echinacea and the garlic to grow. Um, 
And the passion flower, because it's a vine, doesn't need the space, but is growing up. And I put it close to the tree so that it, like the food forest layer I showed earlier, it actually will use the tree as its um, thing to climb on. So draw in perennials, dormant in the winter, full bloom in the summer. And finally, add the annuals just in the summer. So then you really see how full your garden is going to look like in the summer, your herb garden, with everything growing, both all the annuals and the perennials in the summertime. And that'll give you a bit of a, a more, you know, full view of what to expect and where to place things in terms of spacing. So I did not talk about spacing in particular because all our herbs vary, um, but in general, because I have this north, south, west, east compass here, I have placed my lemon balm, which I know can tolerate the shade, in the north side of my garden. I have placed the passion flower here in the southern side because then it'll be it'll be able to see have the sun more. I've placed the thyme and the tulsi and the garlic and the echinacea purposefully in the summer. Uh, the southern part where they have more of that southern sun exposure because they like that. Now the ginger is here in the back because it doesn't mind. And it can be closer to the tree because I know that it's spacing. Uh, it's, it doesn't require that much space. Um, yeah, and the Tulsi loves the sun because it's like a basil. Holy basil is like all other basils. Um, and that's it. So I just wanted to recap tonight. We hopefully extended our knowledge on some culinary herbs and their medicinal properties. We found ways to select herbs in a way that maximize not just the space in your garden so that you could indeed grow in every single inch vertically underground, et cetera. But also we also selected herbs with functions other than their being medicinal. We built in redundancies into our plan and as we placed our herbs strategically, and we placed our herbs strategically into the places where they like to be. We would love to see how you take it from here. We'd love to see your progress. Our Grow It Yourself clients who are all here. So I'm going to stop sharing and because I want to see you guys. And Chris, Christina, if you're still here, thank you so much for being here on the first day of school. <laughs> and Sandy, I don't know when school starts for you guys. Oh, my goodness. Just want to acknowledge my, the GIYers here. Sherry, Sarah. I think this could be Sarah GIYer. Um, who else is here? Um, I saw Andrea earlier, but I don't know if she's still here. Jump to recent. I just want to acknowledge all the GIYers who are here because we'd love to see next Tuesday, which is our first Zoom call, um, when we get together and strategize your gardens, um, what your progress is regarding this herb garden. So that's your homework. <laughs> no, just, and, um, if anybody could use help in this way, unfortunately our program is closed. So I just, we just wanna help these particular group of people right now and make sure that their gardens are progressing, but get on our wait list so that in the future, when we open up, we know you want in and we will tell you when that happens. So it's uh, growmyownfoodcom slash subscribe. And that'll be the wait list for the GIY program when it opens up again. But you're welcome. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Yesterday. <laughs> That's great. Oh, OK. So you have to tell us what happened in your gar school garden, especially. You're so welcome, Carla. So glad you could join us. You're growing from Canada, right? So Pam, I'm able. I'm glad I was able to get on. I'm so happy, Pam. Looking forward to seeing the slides. OK, so you want me to send the slides? <laughs> yes. OK, I will put the slides on. Thank you. Oh, Nicole, I forgot about you. She's also our GIYer. Um, we will send the slides. Oh, thank you, Sandy. It's pro the, these guys, these GIYers know so much now. They could probably do their own webinar. But um, send the slides. And then I have to end. I'm going to end with a video so that I'm not bored. Oh, wait. Dave, do you have a question about Lisa? Hello, um, Dave, do you have a question for people so that they can have the, um, somebody can, can add, the first one to answer this question will get a seed packet. And if you don't have one, I'm gonna think of one really quickly. 
what are <laughs> what are the names of the bacteria that occupy the root nodules and are nitrogen fixers of legumes? Any one of those bacteria that I mentioned. This is just a geeky question, but you can you can totally nitrosomas. Oh, they are nitrogen fixers. Corrizial. Oh man, if you can um, you can. Mycorrhizal, mm, that's the that's the fungi, but they occupy the the roots of the nitrogen fixers. So they are the bacteria, and they're not the fungi because mycorrhiza mycorrhizal mycorrhizae is fungi, but um, the ones the the nitrogen fixing microbes are bacteria, and you can Google them. <laughs> Just the first person, the first person to be able to answer that. What are their names? I just mentioned them really fleetingly, so I don't expect anyone to, to remember. But if you do, who does? So they're kind of two strains. I remember you saying it. No, it's okay. I'm so sorry. They're two strains. And Dave, if you have a second question, you can you can um, type it in because we're happy to send two packets out. That's a good question. <laughs> okay, let me see what else are the else are the Okay, my second question is, if you can type in, yes, Christela, you got it. Okay, so just email us, rhizobium. So one of them is rhizobium bacteria and the other is frankia, frankia bacteria. So they are, they are not just, yep, rhizobia. <laughs> That's okay. You got it. You got it. Um, they are not just, they mostly abide in legume roots, but there are a few anomalies in nature that have these bacteria and they're not, they happen to not be legumes. I don't know what those are right now off the top of my head, but I know they're like a few rare plants that are not, um, not legumes, not of the Fabaceae family, but happen to have these nitrogen fixing bacteria. So, but Christela, congratulations, send us an email so that we can send uh, with your mailing address so we can send you out our seed packet. You are so welcome. Glad you, you were able to make it. I'm gonna share my screen again so that we can watch a little bit of um, Rosemary Gladstar talking about herbs. So Rosemary Gladstar is one of the oldest American herbalists around. She founded a lot of the, um, six. Oh, I changed my password, it's right there, six. Okay, a lot of the herbal institutions in America and I have to do something where I play the audio from an external source. So bear with me as I do that. Does Dave, Dave, I think, is calling me to say I did something wrong. Dave? Okay, I can't hear you. Did I do something wrong? Dave? The sound is not good. Oh, wait. Should I stop? Okay, okay, I'm sorry. All right, I'm going to give you the link, guys. You guys watch it on your own. So sorry about that. It's just a great, a great video to have. So there we go. All right, well, you guys watch that. You have a good evening. Congratulations. You are so welcome. And good night. We'll see you all again some other time. <laughs>